I just want to start with a little story. Many years ago, many years ago in the 80s, late 80s, uh, a, a book was published called The Catechumenal Process. It's a yellow book and it's, I highly recommend it. And uh, when, as we were doing workshops on the catechumenate, one, one lady came to a catechist and says, what is a kachumko? <laughs> so this will be the last time I will use the C word with you. From now on, I'm going to talk about the discipleship program. Okay? But you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I think it's useful to call it the discipleship process, not, not program, because it's urgent to make disciples. They don't grow on trees, if you haven't noticed. And Tertullian already by the second century was saying, Christians are not born, you know, they're made. And uh, so in this little time we have together, I'd like to begin to explore baptized for life in the context or in the manner of a discipleship process. Okay. Um, that process of making disciples of either new people or people who want to be revitalized will also improve our own discipleship. Um, now, lots of people claim to be disciples. In Puerto Rico, where I come from, you say, are you a Christian? Everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm Catholic. But they haven't ever interpreted the Bible. They don't go to church regularly. They may have gone to a funeral or a wedding. That's about it, really. Um, and also, nobody goes to church today because they have to. Nobody, nobody goes to church because they fear hell or because um, their parents will, well, maybe they will, the kids will, might, <laughs> but, but in general, people don't go to church because they have to, but because they want to. So it's kind of important to find out the psychology and sociology of how people come to want something and to commit to it, and to grow into it, and so on. And also, in the same process, how, how we can help them in that process pastorally. Um, because it's not enough to just give lectures about theology. I think we all agree on that. Um, we have to figure out a way of being present with the person as they develop an initial interest, a second stage of inquiry, uh, deepening their exploration of the Christian life, and then some kind of commitment, and then the follow-up to that. Um, and so the, the discipleship process that we're exploring is based on the ancient techniques for accompanying somebody as a disciple, or as a disciple, uh, become, someone becoming a disciple. Uh, along the way. Christians are not made, they're not born, they're made. And I think it's important to, especially in American culture, to point out that we are made Christians gradually. Nobody is made a Christian overnight, not even St. Paul. He had to go to Ananias and learn and, you know, uh, be catechized. Um, it's not like being a friend on, F on Facebook. You can't just click and be a Christian <laughs> or a member of a community. Imagine yourselves facilitating the process of your son-in-law becoming a member of your family. And that reminds me that it's very dangerous, I think, to think of the church as a store. It's not a store. The New Testament never describes the church as a store or a business anything like that. It's a city, it's a family, it's a nation, an ethnic group. What else? You get, you get, it's a community. Okay. Um, in that process of gradually becoming a member of, a, of this family, this household, leads to baptism, in which one is ritually reborn not through some sort of ineffable fairy dust that 
inexplicably makes you a new creation and you don't understand how or, or when or... No, it, you are reborn because you have gone through a process of dying and rising in your own life, in the ideal catechumenal discipleship uh, process, right? You are reborn in baptism so that you can also imitate Christ in his new continuing life. The Greek means his getting up again. I call it his uprising. We are the uprising of Jesus. So baptism expressed to the participant not only the forgiveness of sins by washing, that would have been Jewish, but our rebirth to a new life with a new transformed heart, the real meaning of metanoia, of repentance. Okay. A transformation of the heart that goes on after baptism throughout our whole lives again and again and again. But it's learned, the process is learned on the way to baptism. It's a, it's a huge difference to talk to somebody who's baptized anybody over the age of 12, who's baptized as after a process of metanoia, than to talk to somebody who's baptized without knowing it. And until we recover the idea that baptism is the expression of a process of transformation of the heart, not fairy dust magic, baptism will continue to be this kind of, eh, we don't really need it. You know, we have a wonderful ecclesiology of baptism in the Episcopal Church, and a lot of it has taken ground. But at the same time, it's like, huh, that happened once when I was a baby, and I really, that was just, you know, it's like cutting the umbilical cord or something. It's something that happened once, and it doesn't affect the rest of my life. I think we have to go back to, to the experience of adult baptisms to really recover um, the fullness of baptism as, as an effective metaphor of dying and rising. Um, so baptism in this context is, or discipleship, is a process of orienting ourselves towards God. And in the case of adults to be baptized, the process begins well before baptism. In the case of infants, the process happens through the infant's parents recovering their sense of their baptism, their own discipleship, as well as in the case of confirmants or reaffirmers or um, people to be received. The same process can also be used uh, fairly well for welcoming new members, even if they're already baptized, or returning members after a long, long absence. So, uh, to sum it up, uh, baptized for life is a clear, sustained process of belonging and deepening one's call or vocation. In conversation with scripture, led by lay leaders, with the support of sponsors, overseen by a local priest, it's not about transferring a lot of information. We'll talk about that later. It's about supporting transformation of the heart. In a sense, it's spiritual direction in group. Okay? And we do it in a safe, supported environment characterized by vulnerability and respect. And we'll talk about the, the rules of the game, which you all observed beautifully in the last session. Beautifully. Uh, you'll recognize the rules right away. So this process of uh, discipleship consists of four stages, and I'll be referring to these stages throughout, so um, we'll put them up eventually. Um, the first one is evangelization and welcome. I say evangelization, I don't like pronouncing it, but I prefer it, um, because evangelism, for some reason, is understood to be talking about my faith in Jesus. And that's not the proclamation of the gospel. Evangelization is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which 
immediately takes us to the question, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I actually asked this on Facebook the other day, and I had 32 different answers. God loves you. Your sins are forgiven. So I looked up gospel, and I went to the earliest gospel and the earliest mention of the gospel, which happens in Mark, Mark 1, 14 to 15. And this is the literal translation of it. Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the good tidings of God, that the proper time had been fulfilled and the kingdom of God had drawn near to change your hearts and trust the good news. It's not about Jesus. It's about God's transformative will and the availability of it. Now, uh, huh? Can you say that again? The, the good news, the gospel, is not about Jesus, or well, especially not about Jesus' biography. Because Jesus didn't go around saying, you know, I was born in a stable and three strange men came to see me and gave me presents I couldn't eat. That, that's not the gospel. Now, it's, in, it's natural for us to think of the biography of Jesus as the gospel of, of Actually, it's not even the gospel of Jesus, you know. It's the gospel of God. It's the good news of God that Jesus was saying. Um, it's, it's natural to think of the biography as the gospel because he walked the talk. So, you know. But the, the gospel is the gospel of God, the good news of God, which is that the right time is here and God's royal power is about to be instituted. In other words, he's taking over. In the context of first century Judaism, everybody knew what that meant. We're kicking the Romans out. And, probably, and possibly reforming the temple priesthood who was in cahoots with the Romans. It's not some spiritual event disconnected with local, from local politics. It's not. We may want to think that now, but not in the first century. And this insight is shared by three people who never talked to each other. Dominic Crossan, N.T. Wright, and David Hart, who disagree about everything else. But they do agree that the gospel of the kingdom was about the nearness of a societal transformation. Okay. Um, so this kingdom, I'm going to call it the reign of God, to, to not be sexist, but this reign of God is this world transformed by God into a new world of truth-telling, justice-doing, peacemaking, and love. And the coming of the kingdom and the implementation of the kingdom of God began First with the announcement by Jesus that the kingdom was near, but definitely by the resurrection. So we're already living in the kingdom. It's a common place to say that the, the Christian community is the first fruits or the, the green shoots of the kingdom. It's a good measure to evaluate a community and its liturgy. Is this group of people assigned to this neighborhood of the kingdom already here. Right. Um, so this is wonderful news, but for whom? Who is staying up late at night yearning for the arrival of the kingdom of God? Can I take some guesses? You think? Rich and powerful people. Yeah, right. <laughs> you think, you think, You think uh, Agent Orange is staying up at night waiting for the, for the arrival of the kingdom? It's very interesting. You know, I, I've worked with immigrants, for example, very poor people. And when I describe what the kingdom is and then ask them, tell me, when the kingdom arrives, because you ask for it every day in the Our Father, when the kingdom comes, how is your neighborhood going to be different? They have lists. The school will be better. The, the neighbor will not haunt my kid because she's uh, uh, undocumented. Um, 
the woman down the street will no longer be abused. I mean, they have lists of how the world would be. I once asked a group of Anglos, one man shyly said, I'll go golfing all the time. Now, before we, we, we jump on him, he may have been exhausted and needed right. Sabbath time, you know? So I'm not, but it's interesting that the poor, the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor because they're the ones they, who know what it looks like, <laughs> right? The mothers and fathers of those kids in cages, they know what the kingdom looks like. Uh, so, if we go to those people, or if we pay attention, we can discover what a country immersed in justice, truth, peace, and love would look like. Yes, we can narrow the income gap. We, we can uh, support the empowerment of girls. We can fight the opioid, opioid of epidemic and so on. We can improve education. We can compact, combat climate change locally and globally. We can organize the parish to care for Alzheimer's uh, pa uh, patients. We can feed the homeless. We can open a nursery so mothers can go to work because the gospel affects everything. It's hope for everyone especially for those who live day by day in bad news. So this proclamation of the good news of God is not talking a lot about our faith in Jesus, which will come later, by the way, once we begin the discipleship process, but of working to heal the world, freeing it from its slavery to selfishness, greed, exploitation, and lies. Now, how, how specifically is a congregation, think about your congregation, how specifically is that congregation or diocese a sign of the reign of God? Well, I'd like to, to suggest that when people start, in, people in the neighborhood start saying, oh, that's the church where they have a DACA program. That's the church where, you know, they marry gays. That's the church where, whatever, you're beginning to hear signs of the kingdom becoming a reality. Um, when, it, when, when a congregation cannot be talked about that way, it's probably not a very healthy sign of the kingdom, if at all. No matter how many crosses and vestments and Gregorian chant they have, if it's not a sign of the transformation of society, it's just a spiritual department store. And you can, you can have a lot of people in a spiritual department store paying to purchase spiritual goods, but they will not turn into evangelists, proclaimers of the gospel. Okay. Now, it, it might be tempting to think that, therefore, we need to pay special attention to bringing in poor people into our congregations. And I think, as much as I would love to do that, the reality is that in most congregations, the newcomers at our door are not going to be the poorest, but people with a premonition, a feeling, an inchoate sense that there's more to life than paying your student loans. And yes, they are poor in a sense, and needy too. So the operative question is not so much who needs a meal, although it wouldn't hurt to ask that, but who is living, living in a bad news situation in this suburban neighborhood? And then mobilize the congregation to serve them. It may be that you have, you know, uh, what's, that the, it may be that the neighborhood is full of bored housewives. I don't think that exists anymore, but, but then that's, that's the field of mission. <laughs> They're the abused, in a sense, right? Um, and as a side, side note, this is why God created deacons. 
Deacons are supposed to find out who those people are and where they are, find out the needs, mobilize us, get us organized, and send us to serve them. And a church, often a church that does not have deacons doing that, does not do much outreach except through the initiative of individual lay people. Because we, don't, we clergy, priests, don't know how to do this. We don't get trained for that. Have we ever, has anybody here ever taken a course in community organizing? Yes. Oh, but you're, you're the exception. <laughs> you're the exception. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Um, I was kidding with Puerto Rican priests the other day that uh, they're fools to be, agree to be doing two jobs for the price of one priesthood and diaconate. Because they end up not being able to do either very well, you know. Um, so I think it's helpful to ask ourselves, where did I, where and when did I first hear good news? As a, as a kind of discipline. And I, I was thinking about this the other day, and I remember in 1969, I was a Jesuit novice, and I was looking out the window at the Catskills, I was in Poughkeepsie. And suddenly I had this felt sense, not a thought, just a, feel, a feeling that if God was God, God had to love me as I am. Two weeks later, I came out of the closet. Not two weeks, two years later, I came out of the closet. The, now, that, nobody told me that good news at that moment, but my parents had raised me that way. You, know, you are who you are, and that's fine. And whoever you are, you can be what you are, but you have to be the best at it. <laughs> that was my mother, the perfectionist, right? Uh, no, you don't have to be the best at it either. You know? um, so I think it's a helpful ask, a question to ask ourselves and other fellow Christians. You know, when did you f first hear real good news personally for you? What did it look like? What did it feel like? Um, when people hear or have that experience or something remotely similar, they develop an interest in what's going on at St. Swithin's. And they will sum up all their courage and bravery. We forget how difficult and threatening it, in it increasingly is to show up at church. I don't know anyone personally in Santa Fe other than my church friends who is even remotely interested in Christianity. Not one. And Bill Maher is not helping. Because, it, and it isn't just Christianity, it's religion in general. The number, the number of atheists is going up very, very quickly. It's 20% right now, or 22, I think. Um, so, because of all this, it's seriously important to have a process clearly defined and owned for welcoming new members. Back in the 80s, Arlene Rothage, the oldies here will remember the name, uh, found that congregations that do not have a clear intentional process of welcoming new members and helping them to belong do not grow as fast as those that do. Too much is left to chance, to father's charming personality, to the altar guild network of friends, whatever. But nobody's taking responsibility to make sure that the new faces are accompanied and supported pastorally because they're doing something that is truly countercultural. People will be scandalized when they hear that Sally is going to church. Maybe not in the South yet, but certainly in the West Coast. You know, what? You, you go to church? That's the usual reaction. So, and we need to talk a little bit about the parish as a welcoming host. When you have people to your house, to your family, you don't say, the fridge door is open, take whatever you want, and have a good time. 
you take responsibility for welcoming them. So let's take St. Swithin's again. Someone in the neighborhood noticed or got some good news, some tangible good news. Let's call her Sally. She's a mother of three, and she found church through the nursery um, that the church has during the weekdays, because the church is empty, the parish hall has nothing, no use during, so they, they opened the nursery so moms could go work. And Sally, whose husband verbally and emotionally used to be abusive, and she left him, he was evangelical. So Sally didn't, wasn't going to go to church and hasn't been to church for 20 years. I'm not suggesting that's you, by the way. This is a different person. Um, to, today, this Sunday, she gathers up her courage and shows up. How do we take responsibility for welcoming her? If the usher only smiled and sat her unaccompanied to try to make sense of all that flipping back and forth, we didn't do enough. If someone helped her with the service, but perhaps no one said even hi at coffee hour, we weren't doing enough. If no one called her up afterwards, after she bothered to run the risk of giving her name and phone number, no one calls her, it's not enough. It'll be a miracle if she returns. The sticking rate, you know what the sticking rate is? The rate of new faces that become members is nationally 10%. 10% of new faces end up being members and pledging. One of the virtues of this process is that it can raise the sticking rate to about 25. So, so we have to take responsibility for, for welcoming and not leave it, leave it to chance or even worse, to the initiative of the new person. It's fine to leave the, well, stores don't leave the initiative to me to go shopping. They actually manipulate me through the media constantly, an email and to get me to go shopping, right? So not even that. Um, so let's imagine a process in which we take responsibility. Sally's welcomed at the door by the priest and passed immediately to a friendly greeter who sits her next to someone whom he knows is going to help her with the service. After the service, Sally greets the priest again during the handshakes, but the priest has the same greeter next to her so that when Sally shakes her hand and introduces herself, she says, oh, do you know? And she'll say, yes, I know so and so. And he takes her, because we have to keep shaking hands, takes her off, introduces her to two or three more people, and starts a conversation, right? And of course, coffee. In that process, if it's natural, he may ask her for her phone number or email to keep her informed. And if so, the info is given to the priest immediately that day, okay? Someone, preferably the priest, calls her during the week just to thank her, okay? Sally remembers that when she opened the bulletin that first Sunday, she saw, she saw this announcement right inside the front page. Welcome to St. Swithin's. We are honored to have you with us today. Please do not hesitate to ask anyone for anything. If you would like to meet Father Smith, did we say, is he a, no, Mother Smith, she is available to share her story every Sunday during the hour before the service. Every Sunday during the hour before the service in her office because the first thing a newcomer wants to do is know the priest. They're like chickens and hens. So if you have to create a space and a time that's regular where the priest will be available to new people. And they will come, I tell you from experience, they will come an hour early to get to know you. Okay. So maybe the next time or a few weeks later, the next time she feels like going to church, she may shyly look into the priest's office 
And there she is, Mother Smith, talking with two other newcomers, getting to know each other. The priest welcomes Sally and explains that they're just sharing their stories and begins, this is who I am, this is how I got here. And they do that. It takes about 45 minutes per person, roughly. They share in turn. And they, because there may be four or five people involved, it may take three to four weeks to completely know each other. Okay? This is not left to happenstance. We take responsibility. The meeting is friendly. The priest models an emotional availability and vulnerability. In other words, the priest is real, present, and friendly. There's no agenda other than to get to know each other. After four weeks or so, Mother Smith breaks the, the bad news. It's been wonderful, but I have a new group of even newer people that I have to start next Sunday. Because there's new people all the time at this church. Maybe a face a week, maybe two, right? So Mother Smith, for about a month, has been meeting with this group. And after a month, it has to end because there's more new people. What do we do now? Because these people are hooked on getting together and sharing their story. Well, Mother Smith says, I want you to meet, what do I call them here? Oh, well, we have this process called Baptized for Life. And it's led by lay people who have a group that meets every week. Let me introduce you to Maria and Peter, who are the leaders. So Sally asks them, what do you do in that group? And Maria says, oh, it's great. We are about eight people. We meet on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We hear a reading and share what it means to us. Come see. Sally smiles, pretty sure that she's not going to come to see. But a couple of Wednesdays later, she decides to go and see. And there she meets Bobby, 34, who is considering, considering being baptized because he used to be a Buddhist. Mona and Sue, a couple who want to baptize their newborn, Amanda. Tony, a Roman Catholic who's exploring the Episcopal Church and thinking of being received. And precocious Marilyn, who at 17 is graduating from high school. Her parents, Marilyn's parents, told her that she did not have to be confirmed, but she had to do this and to decide whether she wanted to be confirmed or not. So for her, this is an exploring to see whether she wants to make a mature affirmation of faith. Okay. Here in this group of disciples, Sally begins her discipleship. And in a few weeks, Sally, who has begun to make friends by now, both in the group and in the wider parish, decides that she's ready to explore the Christian life in community throughout the coming year. Peter and Maria tell the priest they will, and they formally welcome, that they will formally welcome Sally to the congregation as she begins her journey next Sunday. Sally go home, goes home excited and a little worried because she doesn't have anything ironed. The next Sunday before the peace, the parish celebrates the rite of welcome and Sally is off to her running start. That's stage one. I want to stop. 